Hello, everyone. Welcome to Earthshift Global's February webinar. We're happy to have our own Nathan Ayer from Halifax, Nova Scotia with us today. Dr. Nathan Ayer is the Director of the Analytical Services at Earthshift Global and has been working in LCA for over 16 years and is a certified LCA practitioner. He's also an instructor at the Dalhousie University where he teaches courses in sustainability and ecological economics. Dr. Caroline Taylor is coming from the North Coast of California with us today. She's currently serving as Assessment and Policy Research Fellow with the Center for Sustainable and Circular Technologies at the University of Bath, and is a member of the ACLCA's Policy Committee and has a long affiliation with Earthshift Global. Caroline has more than 20 years of experience in modeling analysis, much of it in sustainability and LCA. Welcome to both of you. Thanks, Holly. It is great to be here and talk about this with y'all. I think Nathan and I are both really excited. We're going to go through part one today of the biogenic carbon series. We're going to look first at scientific background. Um, you'll hear mostly from me today, um, and we'll talk about the definitions of biogenic carbon, what it means, kind of the scientific background overall, and a little bit about utilization. And then next month's webinar will be part two, looking at the treatment of biogenic carbon in LCA and some of the implication designs and decision for policy that are going to matter. So it's great to have you all here with us. Nathan, anything you want to toss out when we get started here? Yeah, maybe I'll just add on, on the format for the session mm -hmm. in that as much as we love to have discussion along the way for this for this format, we will go through the presentation and then we'll have a question and answer period at the end. So you can submit your questions um, via the Q&A feature on the Zoom meeting, uh, and we'll circle back to those at the end of the presentation. So just please hold questions until until the end. But you can, of course, enter in the Q&A or store them up and we'll get to them at the end. Great. Thanks, Nathan. Well, let's go ahead and, and jump right in, I think. So we're going to start really making sure we have the same terms. And one of the reasons we're looking at this and the way we'll be thinking about it today and next time as well is biogenic carbon in the context of materials, biofuels, bioplastics, forestry, energy, a lot of the ways that biogenic carbon is really significantly important for what we do in LCA. Um, and so we have a, a kind of simple overview picture, mentally all of us, I think, for biogenic carbon being carbon that's somehow in the atmosphere and then in the plant and then in the atmosphere as though it's a priori carbon neutral. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about over the course of these two webinars are the scientific underpinnings that make that both true and not true and dig into a lot of what that, that means, but hopefully not too far into. Um, so in this context, kind of in a general, general context, biogenic carbon is carbon that's come from the atmosphere during biomass growth and may be released later, whether it's from combustion or decomposition or something else. Um, so it's just fundamentally atmospheric carbon through the plant, atmospheric carbon. And but the carbon balance that is the balance of carbon containing greenhouse gases is really central to climate change dynamics, which means we need to understand how that carbon is moving. And how we treat biogenic carbon in LCA, how we represent this cycle, can dramatically change the results. So these are things that we really, there are reasons we're going to spend a bunch of time talking about this, and I think reasons lots of us are interested in. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. And <clears throat> just wanting to reflect briefly on, on what brings us all here. Um, the large number of people who registered for this session, I think, is case in point of how important this issue is right now not just in the world of life cycle assessment, which is where a lot of this, this session, these two sessions are framed, but 
globally speaking, in terms of broader sustainability issues, um, we are moving towards a bio economy and that's where biogenic carbon is a big part of that picture. If you look at the UN sustainable development goals, a large number of those goals are underpinned by how we're going to manage biogenic carbon. And I think the key here is that as the case with any, um, you know, modeling of, of natural systems and phenomena, the way that we model and manage these things are based on the current scientific knowledge that we have and, and certain sets of assumptions that we have about how biogenic carbon behaves within the carbon cycle, how our management interventions affect the carbon cycle. Um, so our ultimately our scientific understanding has to inform how we model and how we model has to inform the development of policy and, and sustainability strategies. And so as these things evolve, as our knowledge evolves, so too must our modeling, our tools and our policy mechanisms. So that's, that's why this is such a key issue. And as many of you who are LCA practitioners will know, we're often need to model things that we may not be experts in. Um, and that's fine. We can develop the expertise we need to do good work. This is a case, I think, where that Caroline and I both feel that a deeper scientific knowledge is incredibly beneficial to developing better tools and better models, which is why we developed this session. So that's just a bit of a bit of thought of on why we developed the session and, and why we think many of you are likely here today. Thank you, Nathan. The, the one thing I would add to that, uh, maybe two things actually, is dealing with biogenic carbon, really actually accounting for it is foundational to our ability to innovate and develop new technologies and new systems that can help us manage some of our major challenges. And to that end, the regulatory space in the US, in Europe, and elsewhere is really relying and beginning more to rely on analyses that underneath depend on biogenic carbon being handled consistently and clearly. This is everything from the obvious things like the renewable fuel standard in the U.S. to the new SEC rulemaking that will require accounting for for carbon. All of this is really important and it's a quickly evolving regulatory space as well. At the end of the day, we have to understand what, we have to have a level of understanding of what's actually going on in the system so that we're talking about it the same way. And so that when we do our analyses, we don't make missteps that have really significant unintended consequences. And that drives a lot of what we'll be looking at and why over the next couple of, of sessions. So let's go ahead and jump in. Biogenic carbon more formally than our kind of general context is carbon derived from organic matter that is absorbed, that is taken from the atmosphere and released to the atmosphere and ecosystem as a whole through biologically mediated processes. And that's that last part of that is really important. And we'll talk later a little bit about some of the things that play a role in this. In practice, it's any carbon derived from organic matter um, in current era time scales. And mostly we're gonna care about um, compounds like carbon dioxide and methane containing biogenic carbon. But in fact, biogenic carbon is the carbon itself, not the CO2, but the C in the CO2. And so when we think about making new materials from biomass or other biogenic carbon sources, 
what we're really tracking there is the carbon itself. Just something to, to keep in mind. Um, I want to say something briefly about what biogenic carbon is not. Biogenic carbon that is cycling, <clears throat> excuse me, cycling carbon through the atmosphere is distinct very much so from fossil carbon that is bringing carbon from, that's been sequestered in fossil reserves into the atmosphere. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that difference matters. And it is an important distinction because at the end of the day, all of this carbon, both of these carbons are from traceable back to plant matter and animal matter. But the carbon cycle dictates everything that we're particularly interested in that makes the distinction between these two. Um, so those are our terms. Let's talk and start really thinking a bit about what's happening on a scientific level. And so at the plant level and in the landscape, we're fundamentally looking at how carbon partitions in plants between the below ground biomass and the above ground biomass. So when a, a plant grows, they absorb CO2 during photosynthesis and they store it. Um, and then they release, um, they respire at night and will release some of that carbon. As they grow, they also pull carbon into roots and develop large root systems that themselves contain lots of carbon biomass. In a forest system, about a third of that carbon is above ground. The rest of it, the other two thirds, is below ground. That's a really big distinction. If we look at other plants, uh, particularly grasslands, etc., that balance will shift quite a bit. And understanding what's called the root to shoot balance, the difference between the above ground, the below ground, and above ground biomass is really important to thinking about where carbon is going in the system and what there is for us to use and how. So I want to take a quick moment to talk a little bit about some of the terms that we'll use a lot. We you'll hear a lot about carbon sources and carbon sinks. And fundamentally, sources are spots that have carbon to be used, and sinks are the things that utilize them or remove them. So I particularly like this new phytologist figure because it does a nice job lining it up against a construction site analogy where we can think of bricks like our carbon. And so we have our power and our clay that are going to make our bricks. That's going to determine how much brick I have. But how much brick I can utilize is a function of my ability to build. And all sorts of things influence my ability to build, whether it's rainy that day, whether there's space to build, whether there's a bottleneck, whether there are companion materials I need. All of these things relate to my ability to absorb material from that sink. Plants are very similar to that. CO2 is the building block of the plant. It's absorbed along with light, goes through photosynthesis, becomes a um, polysaccharide, becomes a long chain, um, cellulose and hemicellulose's other materials, and the plant grows and absorbs the carbon out of the atmosphere, putting a bunch of it above ground and sticking some of it below ground. And just like our brick analogy, just like the simple construction analogy, there are all sorts of factors that influence how much a plant can grow. I have a terrible tendency to underwater my garden. As a Californian, this isn't necessarily a terrible tendency, but it means I get little itty bitty lettuces because there's not enough water for the plant to take up as much carbon from the atmosphere. That's a really small example of something that's 
that's really significantly important in how carbon moves through the system. And that's tied to the movement of carbon through the carbon cycle. And when we talk about the carbon cycle here, what we're talking about is the contemporaneous circulation of that carbon. That is carbon that is moving through the cycle in our time scales. And so just like we had our little plant that pulls CO2 and gets bigger, what's, what we have in the overall carbon cycle, of course, is the CO2 in the atmosphere being absorbed um, so that the plants can grow. It's being put into the ground, but it's also being released as the plants and animals in the land breathe, as the land itself essentially breathes, and as organisms decay. And then it goes up and becomes part of the circle again. And that's largely driven, of course, by the energy for photosynthesis. That's our, our ongoing current carbon cycle. That's what's happening in real time. Um, and we'll focus in part because of the emphasis on materials, but for a variety of reasons, we'll focus more on the plant-centered part of the carbon cycle. But of course, the animal part of the carbon cycle is also crucially important to biogenic carbon. And that's because when animals eat the grass that came from photosynthesis, so the carbon that was taken out of the atmosphere to become grass, they burp, they leave it in the fields in piles, they release it in other means, and that releases methane. And so that part of the carbon cycle is really sensitive to, to the livestock itself. And methane, of course, is a, is a very powerful greenhouse gas. So this system is important. Caroline, I just want to interject a quick foreshadowing to session number two. Um, when I look at this slide and I see the element of uh, cow manure, um, which is actually quite a, a hot topic in terms of biogenic carbon issues right now. Um, in terms of the increased interest in using um, cow manure and livestock manure for bioenergy, um, and in particular around the current standards and how one of the things we're going to talk a lot about in session two is what are the current standards around how to model biogenic carbon what are the current considerations for you know generating carbon offsets associated with biogenic carbon? This one is a particularly interesting one. Is the the way that various you know regulatory and standards have regulatory programs and standards have dealt with how we model cow manure has evolved. Um, a recent development is some proposed changes in the GHG protocol, which of course is an international standard that many people have to have to comply with. Um, these proposed changes have actually, you know, caused some particular groups to actually, you know, start writing letters and sending in their concerns about the implications of the, the change in the protocol or how they can model um, and show the benefits of their bioenergy systems that are based on, on the understanding of the biogenic carbon flows in management of cow manure and use of livestock manure for a bioenergy feedstock. So yeah. that's the kind of thing we'll talk more about in, in part two. Yeah. And it, as Nathan says, is really important both for the regulatory sense, but also for our understanding of fluxes in the system. Um, and as we look at national and international inventories, as we look at ways to meet national, international, and subnational goals, accounting for this part of the carbon cycle is really, really important. So we talk a lot about agriculture and meeting goals with agriculture. And what a lot of people immediately picture is the plant. A lot of people just picture a corn plant, but a huge component of managing it for agriculture and for inventories is understanding, managing, and inventorying what's happening 
in the animal portion of the biogenic carbon cycle. So this is, this is going to be a very important factor throughout. So let's talk about those fluxes. A flux is a flow, a movement of carbon to and from the atmosphere in this case. And these are the, I'm going to show two flux pictures, one for carbon, one for methane. These are from the IPCC um, AR6 working group that looked at flows and tabulates them for us. And what we notice here is that we have flows that are pulling carbon from the atmosphere, things like, like plant growth, et cetera, that's pulling things and balancing it on below ground and above ground, but we also have releases. And so the mechanisms that we see here, and I'll start on the right-hand side, and then we'll circle back and talk about these a little bit more. Volcanoes and rock weathering itself releases a fair amount of carbon that's going into the, the atmospheric carbon system. We have the net land flux that's coming from respiration and fire. And we have the overall photosynthesis flux of carbon. And that is a lot more carbon down than up. But we also have fluxes that release carbon from fossil fuels and from that land use change conversion that increase the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Freshwater um, outgassing will also release some carbon. And then we have another very big carbon flux that's coming from ocean dynamics itself. What this kind of foreshadows here are the, the things that are gonna be really important in our ability to model the system. The difference between the red and the black, I should mention while we look at this, the black is pre-industrial. So the black numbers on here are the pre-industrial um, reserve numbers here. The red are additional fluxes over the period from 2000 to 2010, 2009, I guess. Um, so what we see here in particular is a net change in the reservoir from prior to um, current post-industrial levels. And we see that in the fluxes themselves. So this becomes a really important um, factor in understanding what's happening and why, of course, we're so concerned about getting biogenic carbon right. And how do we make that difference? division here between which is biogenic and not when we have such an interconnected system. We'll look at that a little bit. We can draw the same kind of picture for methane. And methane is a little bit more, um, one, it's a little bit simpler, not a lot, but a little bit simpler, but it's big. These are big fluxes. So we have some in the atmosphere, we have others from the water, from ocean hydrates, which are encapsulations of methane. We also have a lot from cultivation and livestock. And then, of course, when things burn. And that burn may be deliberate, but very frequently when we're thinking about the methane flux, it is not deliberate. That is a wildfire that is another release of carbon that, you know, we'd often hoped to have stored. And so one of the things that Nathan will touch on and we'll talk about next time a little bit is what do we do with this concept of storage when we have risk factors like, like fire in here? And what does that mean for us? So these methane fluxes are crucial to getting the balance right as is obviously the carbon flux, I want to take a moment and just define some terms so that, that everyone has the same kind of set of terms. Um, and so what those fluxes showed us was carbon uptake, 
that is the carbon that's being absorbed, the actual process of absorbing carbon from air and soil, um, and then integrating it into plant matter and into animal matter. Those are governed by biophysical time scales. That's how long it takes a plant to grow, etc. We also looked at in the fluxes, the releases and emissions. That's the return of the carbon to the atmosphere. It's the other side of the flux, generally as CO2, but also as other carbon-containing uh, greenhouse gases. A pulse is a big release over a short time. And so when we talk about the carbon cycle and carbon dynamics, that pulse and a semi-instantaneous release of CO2 can be really important. That's the sort of thing that happens with a wildfire or with a methane pipeline leak. Those are sharp, strong signals of released carbon. We also talk a lot about the storage of carbon and utilization of carbon and carbon sequestration. There's a really important distinction between those two things. Storage is the immobilization of carbon for intermediate periods. That's whether it's in a plant, whether it's from the plant into material or from atmosphere into material. And ultimately, when it's being stored, its fate is going to be to return to the environment and atmosphere. This is in contrast to sequestration, which is the long-term storage of carbon-containing materials so that that carbon isn't going back into the atmosphere. Those are those are some of the kind of key terms that, that come up and are particularly important. Um, and they tie into the time scales of the processes and exchanges that happen in the ecosystem and in the, the global carbon cycle. And those break into two sets. There are fast processes things that release quickly and fast here, maybe years, it may be centuries, it may be thousands of years, but those are fast. Those are big, typically, um, exchanges, and we refer to that as a rapid turnover, a rapid reservoir change, and that's a measure of how long the carbon itself is staying in the reservoir. On the other side of the system, we have slow processes. These are the typically the ocean, the marine, and um, sedimentary processes. Um, they're huge stores, but they're slow. And that means reservoir turnovers on the order of 10,000 years. If we think about the overall geologic time scale, even though that those are long processes, those are not much in the overall scheme of time. So if we look back from current day, of course, there's a long time behind us. And in that long time, there were living creatures and they were organic matter. And that organic matter was cycled and stored as they died and were buried, etc. So, you know, 30 to 200 or 170 million years ago is when natural gas and petroleum reserves were being sequestered. Even further back in the order of three, 400 million years is when coal reserves were being sequestered. So those were living systems at that time, but that time was a long time ago. In practice, what that means is that the carbon cycle doesn't remember what happened in the fossil era. So long ago, we have the deposition of coal, we have the deposition of oil and natural gas, and then we have this itty bitty little bit that's present. And present here, by the way, is, you know, 10,000 years. And from the point of view of the system, there's a big difference between 100 million years and 20,000 years. 
everything that we're looking at in the carbon cycle is in this green block. And most of what we're looking at and thinking about when we think about biogenic carbon movement in the system is really off in that dense right-hand side. From the point of view of the atmosphere, zero started about 10,000 years ago. And anything cycling within that is actively in the carbon cycle. Anything before that, particularly a long time before that, has left the system. And that's one of the reasons we're so focused both on finding alternatives to fossil materials and in understanding what's happening in those dynamics. And those dynamics are challenging. Understanding the movement of carbon in the overall carbon cycle, the movement of biogenic carbon, depends on dynamics that occur at micro and macro scales. So I particularly like this, this picture from the, the U.S. soil report. And what it illustrates here is that what's happening with um, carbon is happening both on the surface where we have the plants and the forests, the land use that we think about, and also the releases from other things in the atmosphere, but also all of the microbial processes that are happening in the soil that are crucial both to the movement of carbon in the system and to the storage of carbon in the system. And there are things that happen um, with light and without light. There are things that happen on very small scales, on very large scales. Fundamentally, getting a handle on this is something that there's a huge amount of active research on and is fundamental to our ability to project, to understand, and to accommodate changes in the biogenic carbon cycle and to understand how things that we do to move carbon affect that cycle and need to show up in our uh, models. So soil carbon is actually crucial to the biogenic carbon cycle, to biogenic carbon in general. And that has a lot to do with the fact that soil quality and, and soil in general influences the movement of plant matter and how plants grow, their ability to grow large um, or not grow large. But so some of the key mechanisms here are this, this layer where we've got the root, the root biomass, the below ground biomass that's pulling carbon into the ground. But there's a whole bunch of processes that are happening underneath these include the fungal and bacterial cultures in the, the subsurface and in the soil, um, how things move through different structural polymers like lignin, hemicellulose, cellulose in their degradation, but also a bunch of stuff that's happening further down where that carbon is being entombed, it's called, um, and stored up either as particulate organic matter and, or mineral-associated organic matter. And then that is influenced by microbes. This is an incredibly complex system, and the work in understanding it and modeling it is a big deal. And the reason you model it, of course, is to make sure you get it right. Like, if you can project it based on your model, then you've got a, a working handle on the mechanism in such a way that you can account for it. And all of these pathways are going on and they're all important. And if we need to know what is happening to carbon, then we need to account for those. The other mechanism that's happening a lot um, are climate factors and climate change. So when we look at agriculture, we're looking typically at this top um, zero to 30 centimeter level. And that's going to be strongly influenced by things like wind and rain, 
land change, erosion, and things like that. But the other things that are going to influence the plant's ability to sequester material below ground and in above ground biomass relate to water, to temperature, to other climate factors. The other thing that is really important for where carbon is in our system and the amount of carbon that stays in the soil are our tillage and other management practices, both agricultural and silvicultural. Um, so how we till the land, how we, how we graze the land, all of these things influence the ability both of the soil to store carbon and of plants to absorb that carbon and put it in other places. That is, these factors all influence how quickly that carbon cycle moves. And when we say it really influences carbon storage, it really influences carbon storage. So on the top here is a great meta-analysis from science last year that looked at how different grazing patterns um, and different fertilization and use patterns influenced soil carbon sequestration. And you know, the, the heavier the grazing is, the more the soil organic carbon stock depletes. But also, depending on your fertilization, the soil carbon stock can grow, can grow, can increase. And that's because as the plant grows, it's also got the low ground biomass. And there's also, we can look at what we plant, changing the longer term, deeper storage of carbon and things like um, grasses with large root systems will increase the amount of below ground long-term carbon. But it isn't just the soil. All of these factors will also influence the partitioning of that carbon between the plant and the soil. So each crop has a general kind of root to shoot balance, but that can be pushed back and forth a bit. And so another recent study, some of my recent study looked at how the carbon partitioned in the system between the plant and the soil with different uh, nutrient treatments, including synthetic fertilizers over here um, and green fertilizers and manure and found, of course, that depending on what you do, you get your carbon in somewhat different spots. These things really matter and they persist. So I, I it's sad, but I also kind of love this, that the long-term agricultural system can actually override these soil dynamics that drive the movement of carbon, and they do it for a long, long time. Time, as we've talked about, is really fundamental to our overall ability to understand what's happening in the carbon cycle and what's happening from the that we want to utilize, what it means for our ability to store carbon, to provide carbon credits, to make materials or cropping decisions also depend on time. I want to say a little bit about the modeling that goes on here. The modeling FAO breaks soil modeling into kind of three three groups. The first is very empirical. It's based on existing knowledge. Those are the carbon balance models. So this is, what did we learn? What do we know about previous systems that, you know, we can, can make that balance from? It's a very empirically observation-based system. The second level are soil carbon models based on the process, on the mechanisms, and they look at soil organic carbon, SOC, in different pools and stocks, but the inputs of the carbon beyond the soil 
are exogenous. They're all coming from outside the modeling. Um, they're not part of it. So it looks at this, those models, look at the soil separately from the rest of the system. Um, that's, of course, a bit challenging. That's the kind of decision that we often have to make because the next level is at the ecosystem level, and that looks at the processes in the soil, the soil organic carbon processes themselves, these mechanisms on the, the panel to the left, and it adds to that an endogenous representation of the carbon inputs. Those are other models for things like plant productivity, for water use, for things like that, that are actually watershed models, things like that, that actually look at what's happening in the system. Because at the end of the day, our ecosystem and the carbon cycle is not made up of small, independently functioning parts. It's made up of a bunch of gears, all of which influence each other. And that makes the modeling very, very hard, very cool, um, very exciting. There's a lot of really great stuff happening, but it isn't easy. And one of the things that is a major factor here is how these intersect in time. Um, so are these happening really at the same time as each other? Are there offsets that we need to count for? Erosion happens, of course, on a very different time scale than some of the other factors. All of these matter. But there's also a spatial component. The carbon cycle dynamics also respond to scale. They respond to the things around them. We can think of these almost as buffer effects. And what we'll see is depending on the scale you look at, you get a signal to noise. So if you look at a small, very focused area, you get lots of bumps. If you look further out, the other areas start to influence what you observe, and you can wash out some of that noise. Some of that noise, however, might be really important to understanding what's going on. So finding that balance and scale is really important. And I'll just add, Caroline, you're doing such a nice job of showing the complexity that needs to be considered here. And one of the things we'll talk about in part two is when we want to use a tool like LCA or forest carbon modeling to try to capture this level of complexity, we ultimately have to draw some boundaries, either you know, for various reasons. It may be for to keep the study manageable. It may be that we're pushing the limits of the capabilities of our tools and our data and our knowledge to go to certain scales. And so where you draw the boundaries, as with any LCA or carbon footprinting exercise, is going to influence the outcome. And I, I've worked on modeling um, biogenic carbon in the context of forest bioenergy for over a decade now. And this, this slide nicely captures what has been a classic debate between should we be modeling at the stand level versus at the landscape level, meaning the entire forest that we're dealing with. And the answers that you get from an analysis can vary depending on which scale you model at, uh, which of course is going to change the signals that we send to um, you know, policy developers and, and innovators. So this issue of scale and where we draw our boundaries is something we'll talk about in the second session. Yeah, it's pretty crucial. And, you know, one of the things that LCA doesn't, has not historically, but is increasingly accounting for are both temporal and spatial factors. And biogenic carbon is a very powerful illustration of where and why that's so important. The ability to look at these things and to just think about these things. Um, in a lot of ways, when we look at these complex models, we're not going to integrate, we're not going to implement this in our LCAs. We might tie to a model that integrates this. We're probably going to look at it 
more at this kind of resolution, if you will, um, because that's what we need. But under the hood, we have to know that the parameters that we utilize are robust. And that means that we need to think about what the current state of the knowledge is. Um, we understand the primary mechanisms actually pretty well. Um, we understand photosynthesis. We understand decomposition for the most part. Um, carbonate dissolution in the ocean is one of the major factors. But knowledge is evolving or missing in some really important areas. We looked at that, that soil organic carbon figure, and those soil dynamics are complex, and those interactions are partially known, um, but also often uncertain still because they depend on so many factors and because they're very difficult to look at in situ, to understand in situ, and so we look at them as pieces and then we put the pieces together. And those, those factors are continuing to evolve. There's a lot of active scientific research going on. Um, the other big area of um, knowledge that is missing or evolving that really matters to us in the LCA community are how the feedbacks behave in the climate system, particularly processes with feedbacks and how to incorporate them. And these are processes that, that might be amplified by climate change or mitigated by climate change. That is, they might be increased or decreased. These are things like the thawing of permafrost, the increased risk of wildfire. Those can release a lot of CO2 or a lot of carbon that have been stored and then that plays into the climate loop. There are lots of feedbacks that can influence the system. And those are, those are big areas of active research. All we can do is the best that we can and try to make sure that we represent both the best state of the knowledge and the caveats where we don't, don't know. I do want to very briefly share this figure from um, a review article from last year about some of the, the needs both um, scientifically and in terms of capacity and sustainable development that look at that this is for, for scientists. And what they're looking at are all sorts of factors here. Where, oh, those are all things that we need to know more about all of these things, all these factors, whether they're the ability to actually monitor the movement of carbon in the system, that would be great, to the ability to understand what's happening in inorganic carbon soil stocks, all of these things are factors where there's active research because we kind of need them. And so the knowledge will continue to evolve. And there's really interesting stuff happening looking at the ability both to model and to monitor these things, and they'll influence how we model the system. So all of that said, in LCA, we're typically focused on utilizing that carbon, and in particular in products derived from biogenic carbon and what happens to them. So we're going to take the last little bit of the, the session to talk about the utilization side of things. And often what we're looking for, we start with a, a fossil-based material like a polyethylene. We're often looking for a plant-based, a biogenic-based replacement for it. And that may be, you know, in the, in the fossil system, we take our oil, we make polyethylene. It, in this case, is incinerated at end of life, and that's our net positive, our net increase. Um, but if I can take it through the plant system and go through those cell walls and into um, biomass-based materials, then my carbon's coming from the atmosphere, 
and I make my polyethylene bag. And from then on, it's pretty much the same. It's still incinerated. The carbon goes back into the atmosphere and it's part of the cycle. These are fundamentally what's happening for any of our sugar and starch based and really any cell wall based material. Is that carbon becoming part of the sugar or sugar polymers in the, the system and being utilized? That means that the time scale is a little bit different. So if we look at a perennial, like a, a tree, um, a willow or something, you know, we start, we plant it and there's a little bit of CO2 emission at that point, relatively a little bit. And then for a tree over the next 30 to 100 years, it's storing that carbon. And then I harvest it. So some of that carbon is captured and some released. I turn it into something that I use and then it, at its end of life, it's released. It's either completely released. So I'm gonna get back to where I was essentially. And that's happening, you know, depending on how long your material is, anywhere from short term to long to 100, to 100 years. But they're also maybe recycling and landfilling that stores it. So these time scales between the plant system, the biogenic system, and the product system are different, but we do have to account for the ultimate fate of the material. And this is why in the modeling, it's so important to capture both the uptake and the release. And Nathan will talk next time a bit about that. I want to comment on the fate a little more explicitly. When we're talking about these products, particularly the shorter term ones, we're talking about temporary storage. This is not long-term storage. This is not sequestration. This is carbon from the atmosphere into a plant, into a material. It becomes product of some sort, and then its disposal, which will likely, depending on what you do, return the carbon into the cycle. You know, and we'll talk a bit in the second session about the implications of this for things like carbon offset programs where, and, and what do the standards tell us that guide our modeling in terms of how long does carbon need to be taken out of circulation to be counted as, you know, a credit for being sequestered permanently versus these more temporary exchanges. So this issue of time um, and, and how we apply this to our modeling is, it it's a, we can potentially make some big mistakes or, and, and false assumptions if we don't address this issue correctly. So we'll, we'll reflect on that in, in part two of the session. And we can make them entirely inadvertently. Yeah. Um, and it really does, it does matter. Um, that long-term fate is really important. So this is looking actually at materials from, from wood that takes different times to grow. And if I grow something and release it, burn it, make bioenergy from it, I release it pretty immediately. Bamboo, which goes grows quickly. Um, if I put it into a shorter lived bridge, you know, it's a little bit better. If I get construction wood, which has a very long rotation period, takes a long time to grow, and I put it into something that lives a long time, like a, a building, then my global warming potential is better. And if I do it into a long-term material, it's even lower. So really, we cannot exclude the time scale or when how persistent the material that is using the carbon will be. You're going to get very different answers depending on, on when that happens. And that's something that classically in LCA we haven't thought a lot about. There are a bunch of different studies, um, and I'm just going to touch very briefly on two. Um, this was a nice study a few years ago that looked at biomass-based polyethylene versus fossil polyethylene. 
and found really pretty explicitly that what you do with your biogenic carbon modeling really matters. And if you don't include them, you'll get a different answer that you can literally change the rank ordering. And most significantly, our methods are really lacking. And those gaps in the methods punish the plant-based products. So we need to think about that quite a bit. And that's something that we historically have struggled with. So I, I really like this uh, picture from Greg Bishop's group. We looked at a bunch of studies for fossil carbon, fossil biogenic carbon from 20, 2011 to 2010. Three quarters of them at least mentioned biogenic carbon modeling. A quarter of those, or a third of those, treated just off the cuff, treated biogenic carbon global warming to, as neutral. They just said, oh, that's neutral. A third of them really modeled uptake and emission, and they looked amongst them, there was a lot of variation in detail and time scale. And then most, so that, that's our good case, our best case. And then we have a really concerning case, and that's that a third of the ones that actually explicitly, explicitly mentioned the biogenic carbon and modeling included only uptake but partially or entirely emitted end of life. And that matters a lot. Um, and Nathan, next time we'll talk about why, why this is so important and what some of the standards say for us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Caroline. We'll do that next time. And, uh, we, have, we have a few minutes left for questions and I'm, I've been tracking number of questions in the Q&A. Um, so why don't we, we'll, we'll answer as many as we can in the time remaining. And then I think we'll try to capture them and um, maybe find a way to circulate some answers to the group or, or share them um, as session two, perhaps. Um, so if we don't get to your question, we'll do our best to find another way. Um, and maybe some of these questions we maybe will address in in part two, I'll maybe try to weed some of those out. Um, uh, so here's one question from the slides on trees and animals. If we are looking at fatty acids, would those sourced from trees be lower in footprint than those from something like grains or also animals? Let I me mean, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> um, possibly. <laughs> Um, it really, really depends on, on all of the factors involved in the capture and production of that material. So maybe, but if you're looking at fatty acids, you're going to have to get from your tree plant biomass, the cell wall polymers into your fatty acid. And that's not a trivial, we can't just make an a priori response on that, unfortunately. I think most of us would tend to start from something like, um, it's probably going to be better off if whatever we're utilizing has more below ground carbon and more of it stays below ground when used, which means that, yeah, tree system or perennial system is probably going to be better than um, an annual, like a grain or field crop. But yeah. Great. Um, <clears throat> here's another one. Is there any particular threshold of time scale that's considered when you're trying to separate between carbon storage and sequestration? Not really. Um, and that's that's part of the Wild West space of um, <laughs> how the modeling is happening and why the standards are grappling with it. Um, I the construction scale, so the longer, you know, longer than 100 years is often utilized for that. But the question 
about whether that's a valid threshold matters. There's some questions that I think are looking for us to answer policy questions, which I don't know that we want to do today. Uh, I'm seeing a couple of questions that would be, I think we'll deal with next week. Here's a question about um, method. I guess what methods are available for calculating the partitioned carbon between soil and plant? There are a variety of methods. Um, there are plant productivity models like uh, Descent or Century. Um, there are um, simple models that are based on the root and shoot balances. That's what we most commonly will utilize in LCA. Um, and then there are more complex models that tie to the plant productivity models. Um, I want to real quick answer the one ahead. Yes, there is a lot of discussion on how to harmonize the different uh, biogenic carbon allocation standards. It's a huge ongoing discussion. Yes, and we'll touch a bit on that in part two as well. So here, I like, this is a good question. How advanced and reliable do you think the current models are with respect to measuring carbon sequestered based on issues like climate and farming practices, soil characteristics, et cetera? And that, that's the heart of it, isn't it? Um, the models themselves are pretty advanced particularly with farming practice, we're often missing the, the detail. That's often a, just a, a representation or an inventory problem. Soil characteristics, plant type, et cetera, we have some pretty solid models for. They're, they're pretty good, um, but they're very all of these factors are very responsive to location. So to some extent, the models themselves are actually pretty advanced and pretty reliable. We just need to figure out how to accommodate the uncertainty associated with them, both in terms of what we know at scale and where we just don't have knowledge yet. Okay. Here's, um, I think the root of this question is interesting. When we're talking about taking credit for sequestered carbon in something like an LCA or, or a carbon footprinting exercise, in terms of how we quantify the carbon sequestered and actually, you know, obtain credits, I, I think there's a question here about, you know, we've talked a lot about modeling and all the scientific models, et cetera. And it, but I feel like we're arriving at a point where also measurement actual direct measurement is may already be required in some cases to be able to prove that it's one thing to model that you're storing additional carbon in the soil, for example. Um, but can you can you comment at all on the need or maybe increasing need to actually also do field measurement to back up these modeling we outcomes? We absolutely need the field measurement on particularly if we want to be able to incorporate long-term credits, we need to actually be monitoring. And in, in essence, we need to have the capacity to say this didn't work out as a credit. Um, that we, we don't have a choice. Okay. Lots of great questions. Maybe you try to find one more. We get this, this question a lot, and I specifically wanted to touch on it. Is it correct to say that biogenic carbon balance is neutral when compared to fossil carbon? This is another, it depends. The movement of, basically, no, you need to track where the carbon went. Um, you're probably gonna balance out, but you need to track it. And at the end of the day, that's why we're having this conversation. That's why we talked about the stuff today. And that's why we'll be talking about how to treat it in the next session. We hope you'll all join us. Great. Thank you, everyone, for all the great questions. We Obviously, we couldn't get to them all. We're going to capture the list of questions, and uh, we'll find a way to get some responses out, maybe just shared with the group, or we'll, we'll figure that out and we'll get back to you.
But thank everyone, thank you everyone so much for attending. We really hope to see you at session two on March 9th. And uh, Holly has posted a link in the chat where you can um, go to register for the next session. And uh, we look forward to spending some time with you then as well. Thank you all. Thank you, Caroline.